Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Deb Wallace, and I'm the Executive Director of Knowledge and Library Services here at Harvard Business School. And I'm just delighted to welcome you to our second Books of Baker. Can you believe it's the second one already uh, of the new year? Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'd like to start by welcoming back our stalwart uh, participants. Uh, we've been almost a year now online with uh, Books at Baker when we moved from the Aldrich classroom to uh, this virtual Zoom space. And uh, we're seeing our, our participants uh, growing and growing from around the world. So uh, we see people um, from who are probably it's the middle of the night or very early in the morning and uh, from all around the world. So Frank, obviously a lot of people are incredibly interested in, in what you have to say. If this is your first time joining us, we'd love this to not just be the last either. The, so we'll see you again and again uh, for you to learn more about the Books at Baker series. Uh, we have a big web uh, page on, a, on the Baker Library website and uh, Mariah or Dina will put the, the link in uh, chat. There it is. Thank you, Mariah. Uh, so that we'd love to have you um, as a regular. So we're going to change it up a little bit for those of you who've been with us uh, for the last year. And um, what we're going to do is instead of me inter um, interacting directly with Frank, what we thought was let, let's bring in a real professional. And so uh, we're going to um, have a, sort of our, our same format where Frank's going to talk a little bit of, uh, about his book, you know, 10 or 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll open it up for questions. But you can put your question in chat at any point. And then to interact with Frank, um, we've uh, invited um, uh, Greg Mistoris from our executive education program. And he's going to engage with Frank um, for, you know, another 20 minutes or so back and forth. He'll, he'll be the person moderating the question. So I, I get a, a, a bit of a day off. Uh, at the end, we'll um, make sure that the this is being recorded, so we'll put the recording up on a link again on the Baker Library uh, website, and because it'll have a transcript with us, it takes a, a little while to get the transcript done, so you'll have uh, access to the recording of the session and to see the slides in probably about 10 days. Uh, but we'll make sure that uh, we send you a video or a video, a link to the video uh, so then you could get to it really quickly. So I'd like to join, uh, ask Frank and uh, Greg to join us. We got Greg. There you go. Oh, whoa, it's magic. That's great. And uh, so let me start off by welcoming Frank Cespedes, who is, you know, I'm sure, um, well known to many of you, especially our alumni uh, who are in the group. Uh, Frank comes to HBS with a wide range of experience uh, in organizations as a consultant to an organization, boards of organizations, focusing on strategy, on executive development, and guess what? Sales. Uh, so he's also an incredibly beloved and sought after faculty member here um, in teaching both in the MBA and the executive education program and Greg will probably talk about that and um, he is an incredible uh, Baker Library supporter. He's one of our biggest users and we are a big fan of, of Frank's work. You can learn a lot more about Frank and his profile. Uh, again, we'll put up a link uh, to his faculty page, but uh, we won't spend a lot of time going into that because he's got so much to talk about. And Greg joins us. He's uh, got over 20 years of leading sales and marketing uh, teams in different kinds of um, tech companies from Fortune 500 to pre-IPO. So he's seen the whole a whole gamut of sales needs and currently he's responsible for marketing and sales for HBS's executive education um, department which has a program of over 70 on campus well not exactly on campus right now but soon to be back on campus we hope uh, online programs uh, for individuals and custom programs so welcome Frank and uh, Greg we're going to as I said start off with Frank telling us about his book, uh, which you saw uh, in the opening slide, and then Greg will join us back uh, in a, in 15, 20 minutes, and then I'll join you back at the end. So Frank, over to you. Thank you so much. Deb, my thanks uh, to you uh, for the introduction, for the uh, opportunity to be here. Thank you, Greg, and thanks to uh, the various attendees uh, zooming in for their uh, time as well. 
Um, it really is my pleasure to be at uh, Books at Baker. Uh, if you do actually read the book that we're going to talk about uh, this afternoon, you'll see in the acknowledgments a number of people at Baker Library that are quite deservedly acknowledged because their research efforts and frankly their research smarts uh, inform virtually every chapter of that book. And secondly, I wanna take this chance to do something that I know Deb uh, occasionally has done in the past. If you are an alum, if you're an alumni of uh, Harvard Business School, you may or may not realize that you in effect have lifelong access to the um, services uh, of uh, Baker Library. And I wanna assure you, there are things you can do and learn there that you can't do uh, through Google search or Factiva. It's good when you're doing market research, investment analysis, uh, putting your pitch book together. If you're an entrepreneur, I urge you to use that asset. Now, uh, let me, if I can, and this always works well when you're doing the tech test and then you forget, where do I find the, here we go, share screen. There we are. And let me do the following. Can everybody see the um, uh, slide here, title slide that uh, has a title of my book, Sales Management That Works? Yep, that's, it's perfect, Frank. Okay, very good. Um, now, um, what we're gonna talk about today is yet another book about sales. Um, if you go to Amazon and you click on books and put in sales, out will come over 80,000 items. Uh, as far as I can tell in my limited research there, the only business topic that gets more hits, more SKUs at Amazon is quote leadership. It gets about 90,000, but sales is a very close second. Uh, you know the old aphorism, uh, no single drop of rain ever feels responsible for the flood. Uh, so let me explain why I have uh, added uh, to that uh, monsoon. Uh, basically two motivations uh, in writing this book. Uh, sales is by far the most context dependent function in business, right? It varies by product. Selling software is different than selling services, is different than selling durables. Uh, selling enterprise software is different than selling software as a service. It differs as well in terms of to whom and where you're selling. Selling in North America is different than selling in South America, in the Middle East, in Asia, et cetera. Yet of all the functions in business, it's a topic where people feel most comfortable making these huge generalizations that are usually unsupported by any empirical data or at best N equals one. Well, when I worked at X, that sort of thing. So, you know, as somebody who's now done research about this topic for almost 30 years, um, I wanna try to explain what research does and doesn't tell us about this core activity in business. The second motivation is that I think it's a particularly good time uh, to do something like this. There's no doubt that uh, technology, digital online technologies, the, the ongoing data revolution is having an impact on buying and selling. But um, my strong feeling, and this in many ways is what the book is about, the managerial implications of the impact of those things on buying and selling is often misunderstood. And the pandemic raises the stakes for getting this right, not only for companies, but also individual careers that are tied to business development. Let me give you one quick uh, example. Uh, this uh, on this slide, I think you would agree is a very common current assertion about selling. And that is that e-commerce, digital, means the disintermediation of the salesperson. And among the many daily predictions we get about so-called new normals, the pandemic is making 
this disintermediation a so-called new normal. Now, here's the data. This is um, about the United States. The internet is not new, all right? It's been around now for over three decades. And after three decades, e-commerce as a percentage of total US retail sales before the pandemic, that is 2019, was about 11 and a half percent, right? Now, by the way, typically, when I ask MBA students or executives, you know, what do you think e-commerce was as a percentage of sales? Their typical estimates are somewhere between 30 and 60%, orders of magnitude more than the reality. Now, here's the data for 2020 uh, from the Department of Commerce. And I want you to pay attention to uh, the percentage of sales in the second quarter of 2020, because it was the second quarter of 2020 that was maximum lockdown conditions, thus far at least, in the US, right? Now, obviously, when stores are closed or when people are afraid that they may catch a virus and die, if they go to a store, there's gonna be more uh, uh, buying online. But notice, even in those maximum lockdown conditions, it was an increase of less than 5%. And as you can see, it's actually trending down again through the remainder of 2020. Um, I strongly urge you to be skeptical about these new normal predictions that I know you're getting daily. Best thing I have read about this is a monograph written by a fellow named Stephen Davies. He's an historian in England, uh, the history and economics of pandemics. And Davies concludes his uh, survey and analysis this way. A major pandemic does not introduce something truly novel. And he explains, I think, why that's the case. Why, when people are separated, innovation takes a hit. It does not increase despite all the cheerleading. What a pandemic does do, however, is magnify trends and processes that were already underway. So note what was happening online before the pandemic. And the reality is that online marketing media were cluttered and increasingly distrusted, not only by consumers, but by marketers as well. Usage on the major social media platforms was actually flat from 2016 to 2019, and it had declined among so-called millennials, among people less than 35. Diminishing returns. Facebook is a good example. Facebook ads increased 30% per year since 2016, but their ad prices have decreased since 2018 and through the pandemic. And the reason is because of the diminishing returns that one gets there. Uh, my colleague Sunil Gupta in um, uh, his research about digital points out that there's actually very low virality through these media. 90% of, of messages on social media do not diffuse at all. You know, there's a common uh, per perception that I think is true, that in general, what social media has done is increase the echo chamber effect, right? Um, uh, you're, you're speaking to people who agree with you. It increases political uh, uh, polarization, et cetera. That's probably true. But notice this data, 90% of these people are talking to themselves, all right? And then finally, we have an increased awareness of cybersecurity, Zoom bombing, growing regulatory and privacy actions. Uh, this is not a digital eats physical world. I think that is the bottom line uh, of all of this data. Now, why does this matter? This matters because I think it affects some of the core responsibilities of business managers. If you don't separate fact from hype in business, a couple of bad things are likely to happen. You'll make bad decisions about priorities, what is an asset and how to allocate resources. Uh, you can initiate a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? You know that terrible phrase that people use about uh, professors, as a professor gets older, he learns more and more about less and less. Well, that's exactly what can happen in business as well. And that is why when you see diminishing returns, you've got to react. 
Uh, you can worry all you want about disruption, but ultimately you need a relevant go-to-market model in order to do something about disruption. And last but not least, in any competitive market, you're gonna fall victim to those who can separate fact from hype. Now, what is changing and why? The most important thing about selling is buying. Who buys, why, and how? And that is where technology has had its biggest impact and will continue to do so probably throughout our lives. Um, this is important in sales because what academics call a hierarchy of effects model, moving a prospect uh, from awareness to interest to desire to action, a uh, so-called AIDA model, uh, has basically been the basis for most sales efforts and CRM systems for over a half century. But that's not the way buying increasingly happens. It doesn't happen in a linear sequential funnel. Buyers are offline and online at multiple times throughout their buying journeys using these technological tools. And that has a big impact on sales tasks and what has to happen if you're gonna manage sales effectively. The first thing that happens is there's more emphasis on the value added of the rep in that amount of time they have for customer interactions, right? The days of many salespeople in effect being walking, talking, direct mail, that's gone, all right? The rep has to add more and more value. Uh, dynamic buying means many more cross-functional interactions in selling. Why? Well, you know, think of it in terms of the old Ghostbusters movie, right? Remember in Ghostbusters, who are you going to call? Who does the prospect or the customer call if they have an issue with the product or the service? Most times, research tells us, they call the person who sold it to them, and it's that person's responsibility to then navigate the different functions in their company. Sales is definitely undergoing a data revolution and that has multiple impacts. I'll just very briefly point out two. One is sales is much more transparent now in companies than it was in the past. This data uh, now moves up the chain uh, and uh, it gets to finance. And once finance gets the data, my experience with boards and companies is the first thing they do is holy mackerel. We had no idea on a fully burdened basis how much money we really were spending and are spending on sales. And then once finance people get data, they're annoying. They start to ask questions and they start to ask sales leaders questions about return on capital, cost to serve, et cetera. And the reality is the financial literacy of many sales leaders is not what it needs to be in this world. And then as a general proposition, I think what you see going on is a shift in the emphasis of productivity efforts to the front end of the value chain, precisely because those efforts paid off in back office operations, shared services, et cetera. Cost of goods sold among the global 2000 has decreased out of necessity in the last 15 years, but SG&A and especially the S part, the selling part has increased as a percentage of firms costs. So it's a little bit like the old uh, story about the bank robber. When the bank robber is asked, why do you rob banks? He says, well, that's where the money is, isn't it? Well, increasingly, this is where the costs are. Now, quick overview of the book, and then I'm going to uh, turn things over to Greg. This, uh, these changes I've talked about implicate core areas of sales management. First and foremost, people. There are inherent challenges in sales hiring that just don't exist in many other functions. Uh, you know, for example, if you want to hire an engineer, you can go to a school, and it's a little bit like walking into a buffet. What are you interested in? Electrical engineering, chemical engineering, et cetera. Same is true. You can find people that major in finance, uh, people that major in computer, pro uh, computer programming. But of the approximately 4,600 
colleges and universities in the United States, less than 150 even have a sales course, let alone a sales program. So the vast majority of salespeople start out with virtually no training and preparation whatsoever. That leads to the other figure you see here, companies who already spend 20% more per capita on sales training than they do on any other functions. But the ROI is consistently disappointing. And the issue is a little bit like what we see in public education in the US. The issue is not do we spend money? They spend a ton. The issue is how it is spent. A uh, process, many sales models for the reasons I mentioned a moment ago are basically based on obsolete assumptions about buying and increasingly analytics and the pandemic reveal this. Let me give you an example. I think one of the things that the pandemic has revealed to many companies out of necessity, you know, in lockdown conditions, is that in effect, they were overpaying for a number of tasks in their sales model, particularly lead generation, demos, you can do them online, a number of meetings where you also can do that uh, online. And increasingly, the analytics show this as well. And then finally, um, deployment and uh, comp processes are need rethinking in order to increase selling time. Again, a data point, the data varies by company and by industry, but in the aggregate, what the data tells you is that on average, a salesperson only spends about a third of her time interacting with customers. And by interaction, I mean all forms of interaction, not just you know going there and making a pitch, online, offline, email, phone, et cetera, about a third. Now think about the impact if a company can increase that from 30% to 35% or 40%. In most businesses, that is a huge impact. It not only increases productivity, but it also opens up bigger chunks of the addressable market because there are now segments out there that were uneconomic that become economic. Um, channel partners. I still, in working with companies, occasionally sit through the meeting, believe it or not, where people debate, should we be online, should we be offline? This is now the third decade of the 21st century. The answer to that is yes. It's an omni-channel buying world. You have to have a multi-channel sales effort, but that has big implications for salespeople. Among other things, when they have to work with channel partners, the individual contributor needs to become as well a manager. And that's one of the infamously tough transitions for most salespeople. Pricing, uh, uh, contrary to conventional wisdom, what uh, the uh, information rich world is doing is increasing the opportunities for value pricing. If you read the book, you'll see a number of examples uh, of this. It's also providing many, many more tools uh, available for actually testing price, but it's an area of business price that is um, surprisingly high inertia in firms about this. But uh, if you don't uh, set your price, uh, others will, and they're not going to have your best interests at heart. And then finally, productivity. Um, in an economy like the United States and most other developed countries, which are fundamentally services dominated economies, right? About 70% plus of the US GDP is in services. That is why the pandemic has had such an economic impact here and in most other economies because it's services, you know, where, you know, essentially physical proximity uh, is more important. In economies like that, sales productivity is not only something you want to do in order to maximize profits and value, but it is also a driver of economic growth. And that in turn has enormous social implications. But, and uh, there's a 
Harvard Business Review article uh, that I wrote that I think is now literally uh, just available, you'll see the data there. The C-suite is increasingly composed of functional specialists. More people than ever before have made it to the top of corporations without any prolonged experience in sales, marketing, customer contact. Uh, this is a very, very big issue for companies, again, not only in terms of shareholder value, uh, but in terms of social impact as well. All right, now that somewhat kaleidoscopic uh, overview of the book. Uh, Greg, let me at this point turn things over to you. You're the master of ceremonies from here on out. <laughs> Thank you, Frank, that was excellent. And I just have to say, I really enjoyed reading your book. I thought it was excellent. And I can see there's already some questions on the chat. So before I begin some questions, I just want to remind participants that you can um, just enter your questions into the chat and we'll start them um, right now and we'll go from there. So Frank, first question, uh, you underscore that everything about business is uh, centers around people, which I completely agree. You debunk many of the common hiring practices showing empirically that we're just not getting the right high quality salespeople we need. As part of your guidelines and what you just mentioned, you talk about context and being really clear about what the sales tasks are and hiring for those sales tasks. So we sometimes don't see that in the hiring process. So what are we doing wrong and how do we fix that? Okay, well, um, you know, first, as I mentioned earlier, there are inherent challenges in sales hiring that simply don't exist to the same extent uh, in a lot of other business functions. But uh, you're right, uh, the, um, uh, the common hiring practices in this area make a tough job even tougher, all right? Let me, let me talk a little bit about uh, some common mistakes and then a couple of suggestions uh, uh, for how to get better at this. Uh, the first thing that's a big mistake is that companies have a dramatic over-reliance on interviews when they hire. Um, the data is in the book. You, you've seen that, Greg, but I also present this data in the executive programs that I teach at HBS. And when I do, uh, the common response of the executives is a little bit like the old Kubler-Ross stages of grief. You know, first it's denial, then it's anger, then it's what they call exceptionalism. Yeah, others don't know how to interview, but I do, I'm a horse whisperer. This is as close to an established fact as anything you'll ever hear from a management professor. It is supported consistently by over 60 years of research. The correlations between the evaluations that people get in their interviews and their actual subsequent on-the-job performance vary from about 0.1 to 0.4, but even in the best cases, it's less than the 50-50 odds of flipping a coin. And by the way, it's a lower correlation in service activities like sales. Now I have colleagues who knowing this data basically say, therefore companies shouldn't interview. With all due respect, I think only someone who's never worked in business can say that, of course you interview, right? People have to work with people, people manage people, especially in sales, but you've got to do other things beyond the interviews. And I'll talk about that uh, in a second. The other uh, thing that happens a lot in sales, uh, when you ask sales uh, managers, well, you know, how do you hire? The most common thing you're going to hear is, well, I, you know, I'm looking for hunters or I'm looking for farmers. You'll hear that dichotomy again and again. And th that dichotomy, most sales roles are much more nuanced and demanding than hunter farmer. And that's why I'm uh, emphasizing, you know, hire for the uh, task. Now, how do you get better at this? First thing is you got to understand that selling is about behavior. It is a performance art, so it's about behavior. It's not about that self-presentation -pre in the interview. It's not simply about attitude, but it's about what people actually do or don't do. So to improve hiring practices, a couple of things. First, get multiple 
uh, get mul do multiple interviews and get multiple opinions beyond the sales manager. Do what a number of companies I think do, and that is they also have people interview uh, sales applicants who don't work in sales. The people who have to deal with the outcomes of sales, who have to deal with the orders, the people in operations or service or whatever. Um, because this is a job that is about behavior, and by the way, the pandemic is making what I'm about to say much easier to do. One of the few good things about this disaster. Whenever possible, you wanna use job trials, internship scenarios, task assignments, so you can actually see the behavior. It's also good for the applicant. They learn more about the company. Um, hire for the task, but also note that the task is affected by the way you deploy salespeople and um, organize your sales model. Again, if you read what um, managers say they're looking for in salespeople, you, you know, the, the lists make it sound like we have to hire all Renaissance men and women. Well, you know, my advice is whenever you can hire Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo, do it. But there are not that many da Vinci's and Michelangelo's out there. And the way you organize the model also affects what it is that people need to be good at and what it is they only need to be okay at. So you wanna use that, that will increase the labor pool. And then the last uh, bit of advice I'd give is understand what assessments are and are not good for and don't misuse them. That's the other trend you see here, which is um, the use of so-called assessments in hiring. And to the extent that they minimize bias, that's good. But most of the assessments that are used, especially in sales, Myers-Briggs is a good example. A, was never designed as a hiring diagnostic. And B, uh, its, its own internal coherence is very debatable, right? Uh, you give the Myers-Briggs to someone in January, you give it to them again, the same person in June, you most often you get different responses. And then on the other side of the desk, very few managers are actually trained in the use and interpretation of assessments. So uh, again, you have to interview, it is gonna be a judgment, but you can do things to make that judgment um, uh, uh, have more predictive power than, uh, than what we see commonly now. That's great. And um, where am I gonna go next is, and I think I see a question already that is gonna be perfect for this. So once you've hired these uh, sales folks, there's a big question which we're leaning around, which is productivity. How do you make sure, because they're not going to sales colleges, as you said. Um, so this question is with regard to productivity, you say one third of rep time is spent selling. What should it be? Well, the, there's obviously no one number uh, as an answer uh, to that question. Again, sales is the most context dependent part of the value chain. It's gonna vary by company, by industry, et cetera. But no matter what company you're in, usually a 10% increase in selling time makes a difference. You know, there is another myth out there that um, uh, you'll often hear this. It doesn't matter how hard people work, it's about the outcomes. Well, let me tell you, somebody who's looked at this data for you know, 30 years has worked with lots of companies. In sales, it does matter how hard people work. There is a very, very high correlation between the number of calls that somebody makes and their sales outcomes. That's true in not all, but many most markets. That's why increasing selling time is so important. The other th way you increase productivity, of course, is to get better sellers. And that's where training and development is relevant. And here I think there's a, just a couple of headlines uh, about this. The first thing is to recognize how adults do and don't learn and how salespeople do and don't learn. Um, adults don't learn the way they learn in an MBA program or, or a college. They're not studying for an exam, all right? Uh, adult learning, the vast majority of adult learning is learning by doing, 
All right, Greg, I hope that doesn't, I hope that's okay to say because you run exec programs here. But again, the research says that's a smaller percentage of learning than what people learn on the job. And so this is where sales managers have to manage. And this is important in sales because salespeople learn that way, but it's also very task oriented learning, right? All right here's the data, all right? Um, the majority of sales training is still, whether it's done online or person to person, is still classroom training. And what the data says is that most salespeople forget literally 80% of what they learned in the classroom in less than 90 days. There's a good example of quarterly short-termism. When do they learn? They learn when they need to. They learn when they're on the way to make a sales call or during an actual sales conversation. Peer learning is the biggest single thing in sales learning. Salespeople learn from looking at the best of their peers and they say, hey, that was clever. That's a good way to handle that objection. I hadn't thought about framing the price that way, et cetera. And again, to make a longer story short, this is where technology is increasingly the seller's friend. Technology is making it easier and less expensive to do the, the sort of just-in-time learning that does have the biggest impact on uh, people's selling skills. That's great. And I want to continue um, with that productivity theme. We have someone who's uh, asked the question, are there any strategies to reduce the length of the sales cycle? Well, uh, the first one, I think, um, and this, by again, very good question because the pandemic is, um, has made this uh, not only a bigger issue, uh, uh, but for many firms, it's, to put it bluntly, uh, a life and death issue. I see this with the early stage ventures I work with. When, um, when you're in a long selling cycle business, the most important thing is to do your best to minimize false positives, right? Because chasing that false positive takes a lot of time, a lot of effort. And again, you always have to remember the inevitability of opportunity costs in business. The money, time, and effort spent chasing prospect A or B is money, time, and effort that is simply not available for prospect C, D, E, et cetera, all right? So what do we do about this? And again, the pandemic has made this a bigger issue because you know, it's, re, it's obviously reallocated priorities. Um, and for that matter, in some respects, who buys uh, in, at many uh, accounts? Uh, I think two things are you know, particularly important. One is lead, uh, lead qualification criteria, all right? Uh, and notice why this uh, is such an important issue. This, you know, these things are linked, the, um, uh, the people process issues. If you look at sales incentive systems in companies, the, the figure I'm about to cite has remained remarkably consistent throughout my career, varies 5% a year, but about 70% of sales incentive systems are based on top line volume, period, end of chapter, end of paragraph, end of sentence, right? Top line volume, independent of margin, profitability, cost to serve, et cetera. Notice what the message is to salespeople in a system like that. There is no such thing as a bad customer, right? Go forth and multiply. And that's what they do. And that's how false positives proliferate. So you need lead gen criteria. And secondly, what you need uh, and again, this, this is a, a, a chapter in the book, you need a deal profile. You need parameters that help you understand not only who is a good prospect, but how we prioritize those things. And again, this is where the data revolution used appropriately is actually a boon uh, for managers. Yeah, I wanted to talk about the proliferation of data and how do you how do you think about managing all that sales data 
and making sure you're talking and looking at the good data and somehow eliminating the noise that just isn't relevant to your business? Well, I mean, first, again, a very important issue, uh, you know, um, uh, if you talk uh, with the uh, folks and for that matter, the companies that have an interest in this about digital transformation, you know, I love that phrase, what a conveniently vague phrase, it's like big data, right? You, know, you, can, you can drive a truck <clears throat> through phrases like this. Uh, I think there are two, um, um, actually three very debatable assumptions there that lead uh, uh, to uh, these problems. The first assumption is that more data is good data. No, the most important data is customer data. Who buys why and how? Uh, and um, you know what happens, I think, uh, in many firms precisely because getting the data is now so easy, easily uh, done, there's a lot of time and effort that is spent on what I would call interesting factoids as opposed to things that move the meter. Now that's, that's managers' responsibilities. It's their responsibility to stay in touch with buying processes in their markets. But that's the most important data. The second, I think, dubious assumption in a lot of talk about digital transformation is that uh, this assumption that somehow data speaks for itself, no. Uh, the data does not speak for itself. Data is mute. Uh, never confuse data with the answer to a management issue. It must be interpreted. And again, I, I'll, uh, for purposes of time, I'll direct people to the book about, look, here's the data. Notice the multiple interpretations available for this data about these salespeople. And again, what you need to do as a manager uh, and this is not something the data itself is gonna tell you, you need to find out which of those interpretations is more empirically relevant uh, in, uh, in um, your marketplace. And then the third thing is this, because there's increasing uh, evidence about this, uh, and actually a very good article, very academic article, but a very good article uh, recently published not by somebody at HBS, but by um, a, a professor at Chicago and, and Stanford. And what they show in their article with data is that the proliferation of information, right? The just-in-time information that's available in both consumer and B2B markets through your uh, smartphone, um, uh, et cetera, what that's doing is increasing the importance of the point of sale because increasingly more and more decisions are made there. You know, there's a lot of people that basically assume that retailing is dead. I showed you the data, all right? Even during the pandemic, um, you know, 85% of sales are still made uh, in stores, even during the pandemic. Um, the technologies, I think, are increasingly um, uh, making smart retailers able to rethink what they do there. And we may be, uh, uh, not death, but on the cusp of a renaissance there. Um, but again, long-winded answer, but there's no one answer to that good question. Yeah, fantastic. And the questions are coming in fast and furious, Frank. So I'm uh, doing my best to keep up, but let me give you another and maybe um, given the changes to the selling role, does the aspiring salesperson need new qualifications than in the past? Yes, um, you know, and you should expect this. You should expect this in any activity like business where uh, the name of the game is um, relative advantage, right? You know, the old joke about the uh, people the hunters that are out and somehow they rustle up an angry bear who chases them. And one hunter says to the other, I don't have to outrun the bear, I just have to outrun you. I mean, that, that's what we mean by competition in business. The other thing I'll point out, and again, once I say this, uh, it sounds so obvious, but uh, companies forget the implications of this. Um, if you're in business, you don't compete with people that went out of business. You compete with the survivors, right? And in order to survive in business, 
you adopt best practices. You learn how to get better because the other companies are getting better. Now, the same dynamic is true with salespeople. Again, you'll see the data in the book, but there are um, a set of skills that are pretty uh, important in sales that a decade ago were considered, you know, the top quintile, now they're not. Does this mean those skills, lead generation, persistence, uh, et cetera, does that, does that mean these skills are not important? No, it means they are in effect baseline skills now and additional skills are important. One of them is obviously um, uh, comfort with the increasing amounts of data that are uh, available in sales. It's a little bit like what we've seen in baseball during our generation, right? I mean, I guarantee you, read his biography, I guarantee you Mickey Mantle was not checking out the stats before he went up to bat. Ball players do it now. Similar sort of thing is happening uh, in sales. And at the end of the day, sales is something that happens for the most part between people. So all of those other core aspects of human relationships that have always been important in sales remain true, but the bar is rising as it does in any competitive enterprise. Fantastic. I wanna switch gears a little bit because this is a question that's come up in a couple of ways in different forms, but let me read it to you. Can you talk about micro influencers, social media, digital marketing? Are they considered solutions to maximizing acquisition and conversion through the funnel? Um, it, uh, they're used more and less depending on the sales model, right? That's answer number one. If you look at so-called inbound marketing uh, sales models, a number of SaaS uh, software as a service sales models, uh, they are important. Now the question, however, is how much time and money are they worth? And here I would point out a few things. One is their major impact tends to be on lead generation, not lead qualification, right? And I think a lot of startups that I work with find this out, right? They'll send out content marketing, people will respond, sign up for a demo, and then they find out the demo goes nowhere. Why is that? Well, when you dig into this, what you find is first thing you ask yourself is, well, who has the time to troll around the internet, read that article that's part of my content marketing, and then do the demo? Is it in fact somebody with buying authority or is it somebody else, all right? So lead generation, this gets us back to the earlier question, Greg, is not the same as lead qualification. The second thing is that this is an area where the law of diminishing returns is alive and well and actually has a pretty steep slope. As those activities become more common, what I said earlier about social media is even more true. It's increasingly cluttered, increasingly diminishing returns. Uh, and then this is the, th the third and final thing that I would point out is this is an area that is increasingly a uh, deep pockets game. The cost of customer acquisition through those media has gone up dramatically even before the pandemic. And uh, in order to get good ROI there, it's no longer a place where amateurs go. You really have to know something about the algorithms that you know, Google, Facebook, and others use, uh, and that in turn uh, generates its own requirements uh, for expense uh, and, um, uh, and expertise. Great, and I'll, I'll lead into this question because I, I think I've, if you've been in sales or marketing, you've heard this question uh, a thousand times. Do you see a conflict between sales and marketing functions due to increasing direct personal relationships that marketers have through digital. So I'm just curious what your, what your view is on that whole relationship between those two functions. You know, I wrote a book about um, marketing and sales uh, well, 25 years ago. This uh, is one of the perennial topics in business, right? In fact, in the book 25 years ago, uh, I cited examples of this in the business press 
in the late 19th century, right? So um, marketing and sales are a couple of things happening, I think, because of technology. A, they've always been interdependent, but at the same time, different jobs. And that's important to notice, all right? Um, marketers get paid when they're good to think in terms of groups, aggregates, segments, as we say. Salespeople, it's a different world. Salespeople uh, get paid to know everything there is to know about individual accounts that they're responsible for. You know, it's a difference, as they say in the science literature, the difference between lumpers and splitters, that kind of thing. They are different jobs. What technology is doing is making those different jobs that tend to attract different people increasingly interdependent. And, you know, again, lead generation in, um, in SaaS businesses is a good example. But I'd point to one other thing, because this is what I see uh, going on. And um, uh, I, I think it, it's, uh, it, it may run counter to the assumption uh, in this person's question. By and large, what I see going on in businesses because of the technology is that a number of activities that 10 years ago would clearly have been in marketing's domain are now things that salespeople do, sales organizations do. Content marketing is a very good example of that in inbound marketing models. And the issue there, if I can be blunt, is whether the sales organization knows what the heck it's doing when it, when it utilizes those tools. So um, th th this is an area that's always been there. It's one of the perennial um, uh, sources of conflict in companies. And there's reasons for that conflict. They are different jobs, but at the end of the day, you know, it's the enterprise that we're seeking to uh, maximize the value of, not marketing or sales. Great. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. So I'll try to squeeze some in because there are honestly more than I can get to, which is great. Um, there's a question about C-suite accessibility. So are C-suite open to salespeople? Well, I mean, you know, um, the, the, I, I'm not sure what's meant by open, but let me, uh, let me just say a few things uh, about this. Um, the, you know, the, the getting access to the C-suite, you know, has always been an issue, but uh, it's, uh, it's tougher, I think, these days, precisely because, you know, the, um, uh, the internet makes no distinction once you got the email address between somebody in the basement and somebody on the uh, 14th floor. That's, that's number one. Number two, I think when people talk about access to the C-suite, they, they somehow think that in sales, it's a question of just getting that access through a referral or whatever. Um, having a C-suite conversation is qualitatively different than a conversation with other people in an organization whose job is to act as the gatekeepers and qualifiers. So that by the time you get to the C-suite, all of that's done and it's a different conversation. So I guess the second thing I'm saying is uh, watch what you wish for, all right? <laughs> Number of salespeople will get access to the C-suite and uh, they may not know what to do um, uh, once they're there. Uh, the third thing I would say uh, is this, um, the important thing to understand again, getting back to the ground truth about selling is who buys, why, and how. And that's not necessarily the C-suite in many, many products and services. So uh, do make sure that that is understood because that's sort of the, um, you know, the book of Genesis for getting any sales model uh, to be relevant to customers. Fantastic. So Frank, I know uh, we have a about four or five minutes left, and I think you wanted to just double back to a couple slides. So, and that's probably why Deb is jumping on here as Deb's well. Deb's jumping in. I, what I forgot to say is we do try to stay on time. And this has been amazing, Frank. Like I, we, we can't get to all of the questions, but um, let me turn it to you first. 
All right. I just want to basically do two things. You know, as they used to say in the um, the old men's um, uh, hair club ads, I not only write about sales, I sell. If you want to order thousands of copies of this book, think about it. It will make a great, great birthday present for your kids. Uh, you can go direct to the uh, publisher. And the second thing I want to say is thank you. Thank you all very, very much. Uh, I want to wish you the best for success, not only in whatever business you're in, but in your career, in your life, never confuse your career and your life. And as we now say at HBS, stay positive, test negative. Thank you very much. Thanks, Frank. Let me start by um, saying as an executive director of, of Baker Library, could I have a better salesperson than these two guys? I mean, first of all, here's Frank showing his gratitude, which for those of you who are with us last, uh, last time and uh, Tom DeLong talking about how important that is to show your gratitude. Um, Frank, we really appreciate uh, all of the work that you do with us and we are delighted to support you. And Greg, I am so thankful for you to giving me a day off. Uh, this was uh, it was quite a, a treat. Um, I didn't let it out of the bag that I used to be in sales for IBM years and years and years ago. Uh, so it's been, uh, I was in the old AIDA model, you know, where we pushed them through the funnel. So it's just been so enlightening uh, from both of you to hear about using the evidence, using the data, uh, not just in a holistic way, but really diving into that, that uh, important data to help you understand who your customer is, why they're buying it, and how they might use it. So you're just full of so much good advice. The book is a fantastic book. Uh, I really do highly recommend you having a look at it. But we also have working knowledge articles about Frank's work. Uh, his Again, his faculty page will have lots of information, uh, his HBR, et cetera. So Frank does so much work in getting um, the, the word out about uh, managing uh, productive sales. So thank you so much for that. And thanks again, uh, Greg, I, I owe you a big time on that. We also, as I say, each time it takes a village to um, pull these sessions off and Ashley Wheeler and uh, Hensley Carrasco in marketing communication will be bringing you the, the transcript and the video so that you can go back and listen, uh, see more of the slides, et cetera, and spend a little more time. Because remember what um, Frank was talking about, about how we learn, we learn by doing. So you might need this at a certain point uh, down the road. So please come back and uh, uh, have a look at it. And then we have great technical support um, behind us. Uh, the A team for sure uh, today, James Brown and Anas Ali from uh, HBS Media Services. We really appreciate you keeping us all uh, uh, online and uh, working your magic. And then my team at Baker, I just can't thank you enough, Dina Gerdeman and Mariah Tumbleson Shaw. And we have a new team member. The um, This program is expanding so much. Uh, we're welcoming uh, Maddie Greenberg to the group. So thank you for that. And our next program is uh, literally a month from today. And this just goes to show you the difference is I don't have a copy of the book yet. I mean, I don't have a physical copy. I only have a digital copy of it. But here's here's what the cover looks like. Uh, and it's Sadal Neely who's going to be talking about her uh, insights into the remote work revolution succeeding from anywhere. So I hope you can join us. And that's next, um, it's uh, Wednesday, March 24th. Uh, from 3.30 to 4.30, and you can find us on the Baker Library website to sign up. So again, Greg, thank you so much. And Frank, just an incredible session. Uh, we all gain so much from your research, as well as your incredible ability um, to bring your research alive. Thank so, you. So we'll hope to see you next week, and uh, take care, everybody. Like Frank said, be positive, test negative, wash your hands, wear your mask, stay physically distance, and uh, we hope to see you back on campus soon. Take care, everybody. Bye for now. <laughs>